You may have seen the bumper sticker that says, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? That's yeah. a functional analysis, right or wrong. They sometimes right or wrong, and it's not, that's not what's important. Staying married or staying in the relationship, that's what's more important. That's a very act-like kind of uh, look at things. Like, you know, people say, I've got to be right. I've got to be right. Okay. How many divorces you had? Oh, three. There you go. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Today's episode of Better Thinking Podcast is with Dr. Kevin Polk. He is the originator of the ACT matrix. Now, if you know anything about acceptance and commitment therapy and you've been studying it or following it for any length of time, you would have known about the matrix. It's this elegant way that in some sense encapsulates quite a significant amount of the ACT hexaflex, so to speak. And Kevin looks at it in, in, in such a fascinating way, you know, looking at the internal experience, the internal world versus the um, external world or the, the, the five senses world. There's some really amazing insights um, and it's just a pleasure to, to talk with uh, Dr. Polk because he's so chilled out and relaxed. He just has a good old time and he's laughing half the time. It's good, good value. So enjoy. Welcome back to Better Thinking Podcast. Today's guest is the amazing Dr. Kevin Polk, who's done some fantastic work in the acceptance and commitment therapy world, particularly with his model around the ACT matrix. So welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful to have you on, on, on the show. You've been someone I've been really looking forward to uh, touching base with, you know, knowing that, that, that my, you know, my, my baby as well is, is you know, except as a commitment therapy, I, 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 I love it. I, I enjoy it. It's something that I try and live by my, my, myself. And I think your, your model is exceptional. So it's lovely to be able to, you know, have you on board and uh, pick your brain. Okay. Tell us a little bit about, uh, I suppose, um, for our guests who might not know you as well, uh, about the ACT matrix and, and, and how it works, how it, how it came to life, how it was born, so to speak, um, because it's been something you've been doing for some time. Since 2009, so it's 10 years old. Oh, anniversary uh, this year. It is. Uh, a little bit past, it was the spring of 2009. Um, a couple of things had happened. Uh, one, I had created a lecture uh, for something called functional contextualism. That'll kill your listeners. Uh, but it, basically, that's what ACT is based upon, which is you look at people's behaviors or your own behavior in the context that it's occurring within. And so I drew a diagram and had uh, the function of the behavior along the horizontal line and the context, whether it was internal or external, on the vertical line. So I had that. Uh, didn't do much with it. Never even gave the lecture because of the snowstorm. Uh, and then later on was listening. Oh, no, no, I had read a book uh, called Derived Relational Responding. Ooh, that, ooh, that's horrible. I, I know those are big words. But nevertheless, in that they were having some, uh, they, they were having autistic kids do sorting games which is high, you know, low versus high, red versus blue, um, you know, forks versus spoons, whatever, sorting. Uh, and I, I thought, well, you know, humans could sort their internal and external experiences along that. So I got the, the diagram back out and said, well, we can have our external five senses experiences and we'll put those at the top. And then we can have our internal mental experiences, and we'll put those in the at the bottom uh, of the line. And then for the horizontal line, I said, "Well, we could be moving toward who are you know moving towards stuff that's important to us. Basically, it's it's positive reinforcement. And then over on the left is when we're doing stuff to get away from, reduce yucky feeling stuff like fear and pain and pain and such." Uh, and voila, I had the matrix, uh, and it was born at that time. I drew it up on a board, started showing it to a couple of people. They went, wow, that's really good stuff. Um, 
later that day, I got on the internet and gave it away to the internet. So that's one reason why it got around a lot. I never copyrighted it or anything. I just thought it was something good to give to the world. Um, and finally, that led to uh, the first book that we did on it, which is a chapter book, meaning different authors wrote chapters about how they were using the matrix. Where, so pain management, school, um, wherever they were doing with it, uh, we did that. that. That was well received. And so then they wanted another book, sort of a guide. How do you do the back matrix you know, in a book form? Uh, which, you know, you could really do it in 5,000 words, but they wanted 100,000 words. So <laughs> we padded it with 95,000 extra words uh, and got it out there. So, uh, and by the way, the matrix is about simplicity. So when you hear me talking about that kind of thing, it, it's about not using language. It's about just just stripping away language whenever you possibly can. So books are a little bit antithetical to the matrix, <laughs> which books want a lot of words. Uh, and with the matrix, we want to get people into the experience. So we use words to uh, get folks into an experience. And so the words have a very specific use and you don't use very many of them if you're doing it like I do it. And, uh, so, so that's the story of it, and uh, it it's it's been really successful. Uh, as far as I know, it's used in essentially every country except for North Korea, and I just haven't heard anything from North Korea. So, uh, for for good reason. Uh, but other than that, I'm like, my goodness, even little island states and stuff around and. You know, Russia and the Eastern Bloc countries and all the European and Australia, of course, New Zealand, and Sri Lanka, and that, the list goes on and on. Even we got it to Antarctica. Somebody uh, poked a di the, the diagram into their backpack and took it to Antarctica. <laughs> Uh, one of the fantastic <laughs> things about the, the the model that strikes me as a clinician is is exactly what you said: the simplicity. You know, the this sorting space of being able to kind of recognize is this an internal experience or is it an external experience and and you know is it in my mind or is it in physical form and and just that alone is 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 a phenomenal amount of uh, you know observation and recognition and it kind of you know whether we talk about it from a diffusion perspective or the observer you know or being mindful it encapsulates so many aspects of of you know the ACT framework or, or even if we go deeper, the, the RFT sort of, um, you know, consideration of removing. Oh, RFT. He said a fancy term, relational yeah. frame. <laughs> well, I thought if we're going to go on. No, I didn't. I didn't add into the story that uh, there was, there was a guru of RFT. Oh, no, I'm going to blank on his name. Uh, it'll come to me later, but he was talking about RFT essentially in a way of explaining how five senses experiences were transformed into mental experiences, uh, oftentimes those being words. And so that's what you're referring to is we're noticing the difference between the five senses experience, which is just an experience, and then the the words that we use to then label and categorize those experiences. And they're really two entirely different things. And, uh, but to notice that difference is hard for humans. Do you mind just talking us through those two different, you know, uh, perspectives on that, that vertical line, the, you know, the external world, the internal world? Yeah. So, just to set everybody straight, almost everybody has five senses, six senses, or six, because they'll throw in proprioception. But anyway, those are at the top. Uh, What's that one? I, I, I haven't heard of that one. My apologies. If you know where your hand is in space like that, I well, I can see it because it's on camera. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you know where your limbs are in space. Uh, that's a sensory experience 
sense, and that's proprioception. And so long ago, I'd say the five senses, and then somebody would raise their hand and say, what about proprioception? I was like, great. Well, I don't want to say six inches, six senses, because that brings up a whole nother can of worms. So uh, that's why. Whatever your sensory experience is, and uh, but proprioception is one of them, most definitely. Uh, and uh, it's used in sports all the time. So, um, so anyway, that and when you're a baby, let's take it through. When you're a brand new baby, you come out, come out of the womb. There you are. You are a sensory being. Uh, you've heard some language, you know, through the womb, uh, but you don't really know it yet. You haven't got it. So you're literally just experiencing the world through your senses. Uh, and that's it. <clears throat> and by the way, your sense of proprioception is pretty poor at that point. If anybody's watched a newborn baby <laughs> uh, flail around, they're not very good at uh, noticing where their hands and feet are within space. Uh, so but anyway, them cute. and it exactly makes them very cute. Uh, and uh, but then, and especially there's been people do uh, time lapse recordings of this. You can listen to uh, how in the English language, uh, suddenly the, the kid starts hearing lots of mama, 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 daddy, 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 mama, mama, daddy, daddy, mama, mama, uh, you know, a few thousand times. And, and, and over a while, you know, the, the kid knows that the sensory experience of seeing mom uh, is expressed as mom or mommy and then seeing daddy is you know, dad or daddy or whatever. And, um, and that's some of your first words you ever developed right there. And uh, that just means your frame and in, in a relational frame theory, you're taking the frames of relationship, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, all of those things. And they're being framed onto that sound mommy. So let's stick with that. And, now, the explanation for that is very complicated within relational frame theory, but that's what it's going about explaining, uh, is how that, that happens. Uh, and it's a derived relational response, by the way. Uh, one of the first ones, you drive up this response that, oh, that's mom over there. And, and, and one, it feels good in your own head because it's, you, you mastered something. And of course you also get rewarded for mom because she does a little happy dance and yay, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so you, that's, that's the beginnings of this language engine that you get going. Uh, and then you pick up a whole lot of it, a whole lot of language that is, uh, let's jump ahead all the way to being, you know, 10 years old, 10, 11, 12 or so. And you cross over this line into where you can daydream and you can live out your life inside your head. And this sort of a daydream world. And so you're exper you've transformed all these experiences, seeing things and hearing things and tasting things onto language that you can then review in your head. And it's also images. Uh, and now you can live inside your head. Well, great. You can live inside your head. A uh, little problem with that uh, is now you're removed from the natural consequences of the five senses world. And uh, all kinds of trouble can, can come of that. That's some good stuff too. But that's what ACT is about then. is like, okay, if somebody's having troubles, basically ACT says, well... We know that the person's gotten in too much into their head and they're living out too much of life in their head and they're not experiencing the natural consequences of their behaviors because they're thinking things are okay or not okay or whatever uh, and they're not experiencing them. Uh, so then you get the title, one of the titles of a the set, well, one of the self-help books uh, put out by ACT, this one by Steve Hayes, which is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. Uh, and that's just reversing that process that I just said of how you get out of your head and start noticing stuff going on in your sensory world. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, and there I go, being simple again, but 
That's act. And that's why it can be summarized in 5,000 words rather than 100,000. Oh, yeah, yeah. And 5,000 is a little hefty. 5,000 is a little hefty, actually. <laughs> I use that term because they can do it. it. It's much better to just draw people into the experience. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and your listeners probably don't even know what that means. So let's, can I tell, can I show them what that means? Absolutely. To, to use words to draw people into an experience. Okay. I'll ask a question then. And to you and to all of your listeners, but you're going to answer me. And that is, who is important to you? I would be, uh, you know, immediately going to my immediate family, you know, my children, my wife, okay. parents, okay. brother. There you go. Obviously my friends. And now we'll pause. And so how do you feel? that you just relate that you just had to bring up all those people and you thought about those people. Mm. Um, there's a sense of uh, gratefulness, um, some warmth in my, in my, uh, okay. So that's what I mean with a simple question of, Hey, who's important to you? And then the person, you can see them, they go inside themselves and, they start thinking about who's important to them. And then you can see the experience start to wash over them as they think about who's important to them. That's what I mean. And that's, that's using a very few words uh, to simply bring somebody to an experience. Let's do it another way. If you don't mind, Nesh. Sure. Nesh, did you know that, that there are some people in your life who, who you value? And these valued people, you can see where I'm going here. I'm off into an intellectual diatribe, and I'm going to teach you about the value of people and all that. I want to teach you something. In the ACT Matrix, we don't teach anybody anything. We draw them into the experience. And that's why just with these simple questions, you draw people uh, into these experiences. Anyway, I can say something. I can say something like this. This is another fun one. You know, I'll say, you know what? Sometimes yucky stuff can show up inside of you and get in the way of moving towards somebody who's important to you. And so, you may know of this example. Maybe you were you back when you were younger. I don't know, teen or something, and you saw some person that that you would like to ask out on a date. You know, ooh la la, this would be fun, you know. And just about the time you thought about asking that person out on a date, something probably showed up inside of you. What showed up inside of you as you thought about asking that person out? It's interesting because that stuff activates even now you know you can feel that <laughs> stuff inside you you know you picture yourself as a little you know for me a little boy standing you know in front of the the school having rehearsed those lines <laughs> so many times you know yes. um, what am i going to say what am i going to say <laughs> and, you know and you had everything all perfect and you know you're and it was this all ready to go. And, 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 and of course, most people, you know, they say, they say it's fear. You know, I'm afraid they'll say no because that, that hurts, you know. <laughs> that doesn't feel good when somebody says no that you wanted to ask out. And, uh, and, and just almost everybody has that experience. And just with those few words and that little story, I bring them into that experience. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, so we're not trying to teach people the diagram so much. But I will then at that point say, okay, so now we got this, just to be clear, in the lower right quadrant of the matrix, there's two lines, right? So lower right, we put who and what's important to you. The yucky stuff that can show up, and it doesn't always have to get in the way of who's important to you, but you know, stuff like fear and pain and stuff uh, goes over in the lower left. And then at that point, I'll usually fill them out some more. But you'll notice that I'm bringing them into these stories and throwing people into their head. By the way, the one with the teenage, going sending people back to their teenage years is a me here now versus me there then uh, question. 
uh, and frame of reference, which is part of RFT. So I've sent them into noticing the difference between themselves now and their cells back then, uh, which is a whole nother thing. All done with the observer self, with some of the stuff that you mentioned. It's, it's, it's most easily summed up under the observer self. There's a real disconnect between the me, me here now versus the me there then. Uh, as as, as when, when we go, when, you get, when we get pulled into, um, you know, the story, uh, you know, we, we almost become that child again. In, in, oh, yeah. Oh, very much so. At least the way we remember it. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, it's a very edited story. We edited it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, and as you go back to that story. And, and get it in. So when I, when I say draw people into an experience, that's that's what I'm talking about. Now let's go back to why was Kevin trying to develop something like the Matrix? Well, I was like every other person who did uh, acceptance and commitment therapy stuff was teaching the hex- Hexaflex. Okay. And so... And people won't know what the hexful flex is. I, maybe some of them will, but sure. uh, it's this diagram of the core processes of acceptance and commitment training and therapy. And uh, and what most people do, new to that, uh, go back to what you learn how to do in school, which is to teach stuff. And so you start teaching people about the different aspects of it. And uh, well. That can be all well and good, but that's not drawing people into an experience. And it takes quite a bit of time to to really, truly teach the hexaflex and get people up to speed. So there's lots of situations when you're working with other people, and, and whether it be a school or a coaching situation or even a therapy situation, where you just don't have that luxury of that much time. Uh, and I took to heart the first title of the first act book, which was an experiential approach to behavior change. Did you know that? I didn't know that was the, the acceptance and commitment therapy. And then right below it, it says an experiential approach to behavior change. And so I knew that. So that's why I was searching for that, that way of drawing people into an experience very quickly. And it was repeatable, you know, very repeatable and I could teach it to other people very quickly uh, and uh, they could then do the same thing. And so there's more than one way to do it. I have my routine, but whatever it is. So, so I no longer teach the hexaflex. Now I draw people into the experience of the matrix. Uh, that's, and that's what I practice pretty well every day of my life. And in essence, you're you're kind of encouraging uh, people to move from uh, that internal um, uh, space to to recognize it, notice it, observe it, and and move into the uh, into that upper area, which is the yeah. you know, consequential world, the physical world. You know, where, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we where we yeah. we end up living. Um, you know. Uh, at least in that physical plane, uh, rather than spending so much time in our internal um, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the the internal representations and and uh, imaginations and storytelling and you know assumptions and so on that goes on. That's all of it, exactly. Uh, most humans, I dare say, if you look at it from the matrix point of view, so the you've got the the vertical line and then it's it's bisected by by the the horizontal line. So most of us humans, by the time we're teenagers, we're dipping down below the horizontal line. Uh, (laughs) We're starting to spend more time in our heads and paying more attention to our our head stuff than we are our senses, our sensory experiences. And so the, the trick, if you may, is to draw people up at least to the middle uh, or the crosses are or it crosses and usually a lot of people will circle put a circle there and put noticing 
Uh, and so it's so that you're always noticing what's going on in your head and what's going on in your five senses. And when you do something in particular, anything that you do, you will also pay attention to the physical consequences that occurred. That's what's so important because your head will fool you. You're, the human mind is entirely unreliable. It's just it's really we have the scientific evidence. It's very unreliable. <laughs> I love that in in insights the 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 fact that you know in 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 many ways that's that kind of leveler. You know, it, it means that we're all in the same boat where our our primary um, you know navigator, our, our, our primary steering wheel. Uh, is completely unreliable, whether it be those thoughts, whether it be the feelings, you know, they're making huge assumptions. Um, we're, we're kind of being steered in, in, you know, really away from pain, you know, whatever that perceived pain is, you know, that, 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 that's the driving force, whatever is painful, I'm going to get away from. And, and, and uh, the more that we become, uh, in, in uh, developed as, as countries and, and, you know, the more we become civilized, the less pain we're willing to to uh, hold, generally speaking, if I can if I can say that. Very much so, yeah. And so, and the way you do it in your mind is you create a new story, or you create a less painful <laughs> story, right? You you re quickly rewrite the script uh, and get it so that it's less painful. Uh, that does not have to have anything to do with reality just as easily write it into a novel, science fiction novel. Well, I remember, I, I remember it was painful to go out and do studies at, uh, you know, at year 11 and 12. So I rewrote the script and I said, I don't need education. You know, this is for our losers. And, um, you know, exactly. what, what's that for? And, and you know, um, there's plenty of examples that I can read about of, you know, people who have got, you know, whatever lives that I was aspiring to at the time, let's just call them successful lives. And, and they did it without, you know, they, they dropped out at year eight. So of course they did, right, yeah. Education for. <laughs> that was all fun, right. And, and it's not that the human mind's not useful. It creates a bunch of stuff and comes up with some useful words and this and that. It's just an unreliable way of gathering data on the effectiveness of our behaviors. And, uh, so you do something and then you make sure to look at the data, the, the five senses experiencing. I do apologize. How, how do you assist and help people to, you know, experientially uh, appreciate the unreliability of the mind? Of Usually our- that's done in the form of homework. Homework in quotes. It's like, it's not really very strict homework. But uh, nevertheless, it's homework. Uh, And that go do something. And notice, with your five senses, notice the effect of what you're doing, of what you did, uh, and do that. Now, you can also notice what's going on inside your mind, but you want to compare both of them. So somebody will say, you know, whatever, whether it's, I'm going to go into matrix talk here, whether it be a toward move or an away move. So toward move might be, I'm going to buy my wife flowers. Great. So when you go buy your wife flowers, you know, and you go, and are you actually going and say, this is Kevin Polk. This is the way I do it. So forgive me, forgive me, but I'll say, and so are you going to give your wife the flowers? Oh yeah, cool. Well, you know, you could just buy them. not go. And I get a laugh out of that. Yes. I'm going to give my wife the flowers. Great. So when you, when you, Give your wife the flowers. Notice the the effect <laughs> of that that the five senses experience. You could also say, you know, well, do you have something that you avoid a lot? And people say, oh yeah, you know, I avoid this anxiety. This great. So the next time you go about avoiding that thing and doing that away move, I want you to carefully notice what goes on inside your head. And notice the five senses consequences that that go along with that away behavior, uh, and that's how it sounds of getting people to notice both aspects, always noticing both. 
you, the human mind is not going to let you get away with just noticing the senses. It's way too sophisticated for that. Uh, so, but it can pay more attention to the external experiences, the five senses experiences. And people get pretty good at that pretty quickly. Uh, they'll come back and tell you what they noticed. And if, even if they didn't, the reason I said homework and quotes, because I never require people to do homework. So I'm like, if you remember to do that homework, great. If you don't remember to do that homework, that's okay too. <clears throat> it's not a big deal. And it's not a big deal because people will always come back. And even if they say, I forgot to do the homework, it's like, okay, well, you did you do anything? Yeah. Did you notice five senses experiences? Yeah. There you go. You did it. And then we'll talk about that. So a lot of it is getting people out into life and getting them noticing um, mm. on their feet. There's something about curiosity, you know, almost like going out into the world, you know, and, and, and running if I can use the word, some experiments where it is. You know, as, as an experiment, you're curious, you want to kind of just look at it, examine it, not, not with judgment, but with curiosity. With the curiosity. It's like the kid dropping the thing out of their crib, you know, seeing if gravity really works. <laughs> uh, they'll do it repeatedly, you know, and they're like, pretty after a while again you know this thing really works every darn time that's amazing uh so uh anybody who's been a parent has watched a kid do that you know and they'll do it with food as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly all right they'll do all kinds of experiments you know and see what the results are and they're just sort of curious about it really it's this this innate curiosity and so you want to get back to that curiosity yes and 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 no judgment about it you know people what what do you usually do for an away move i drink a fifth of whiskey oh okay so the next time you go about drinking a fifth of whiskey you know i want you to notice i mean i don't flinch <laughs> it's mm, like mm. okay yeah. notice what happens when you drink a fifth of whiskey with your five senses experience and and you know, a lot of people will be surprised. Aren't you supposed to tell me not to drink a fifth of whiskey? Well, I guess some people might think I was supposed to, but I don't think it's going to be a, do a darn bit of good. <laughs> Whether I tell you to or not, or really. <laughs> it's not. It's just not. You, you've got to learn whether that's an effective uh, away move in terms of your five senses or not and the effects that it's having on your life. Uh, and then when you bring into the next concept, which is where do you want to go in life? You know, that's and that's values and act, by the way. But that's it, a toward move. Well, no, it's all, all away moves are highly uh, good for life as well. You know, like getting out of the way of a bus, cracker yeah. jack, good way for staying alive. <laughs> very effective. Uh, and uh, you know, people diss on away moves. I don't diss on away moves. They're just moves. Sure. Uh, and sometimes they're very necessary to keep you alive, you know, do something. Uh, and, uh, and so the, either the away or toward, but then you end up asking the question is, is it working for the life that you want? And like, well, I don't know what the life what I want. Well, that's probably a conversation you want to have with yourself. <laughs> so, you know, where do you want to go? <laughs> what do you want? What do you, what do you want? I, that's not my That's business. that horizontal plane that you're talking about there is there's, there, there's a one side, you know, toward and the other side away. And it's toward the life that you want or away from. No, it's not away from the life you want. Uh, either one can work. It's, it's, uh, Nesh, it's it's really weird. You draw a whole a circle all the way around the, the matrix, all the way around it, and then you just put you know the life that you want everywhere, everywhere, okay, <laughs> and okay. and outside of it, and you ask, is this behavior or even this thought or this feeling, whatever, uh, is it working for the life that I want? Is this doing doing the trick for what I want? So in this case, I got out of the way of a bus. I stayed alive. I could ask myself the question, well. Did that work for the life that I want? Yep. It's really a functional assessment. Bad. Uh, oh my God, you love those technical terms. Yes, that is a functional. So now what we've done is got everybody, even on this podcast, up to you can do a functional analytic look at your own life. And so you became a, a functional behaviorist, or whatever. Uh, but it does require that you have a general idea where you want to go in life. Sort of like I want to be a good parent or, you know, I want to be 
good citizen or something you know so and in act they call them values but i don't use the term values very often so uh the reason being it's a sticky word oh no i just introduced another act concept oh well words are sticky by their nature let's let's sure. go to that they're sticky mom is the stickiest word why would mom be the stickiest word lots and lots of connections <laughs> massive number <laughs> massive uh, people are there what's a good example of a sticky word oh in english that's easy mom <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very yeah. sticky uh and uh we go on and on there's other sticky words i would have thought i would have thought uh, even above and obviously you know this is probably a bit, bit bit semantics but uh right you know right and wrong uh oh my god that's are, a double uh, yeah, hugely sticky mom I think they'd oh, be up right. there. Yeah, but mom taught you right and wrong. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, all roads lead back to mom usually. Dad or whatever. <laughs> but I've done this a lot, so I know. But you're right. That that right or wrong thing is very much uh, very, very, very sticky uh, concept. And, uh, of course, in the Matrix, then we, we, we don't do right or wrong. We, we ask, did it work? Well, aren't you going to tell me whether it's right or wrong? I have no idea if it's right or wrong. It's not the question. The question is, does it work? Yeah, is it helpful? Sure. Is it helpful? That's the that's the trick. By the way, that's the underpinnings of acceptance and commitment training and therapy is to lay off of the, the linear thinking and go to the, the par- parallel thinking, the nonlinear cause and effect kind of stuff. And uh, that's getting a little bit heady, but it's it's easy to in concept. You just you're not worried about right and wrong. You're worried about workability. And there's a practical term for that. You may have seen the bumper sticker that says, "Do you want to be right or do you want to be married?" <laughs> <laughs> Hey, there you go. That's yeah. a functional analysis, right or wrong. They sometimes right or wrong, and it's not. That's not what's important. Staying married or staying in the relationship—that's what's more important. That's a very act-like kind of uh, look at things. So like, you know, people say, "I got to be right. I got to be right." Okay. How many divorces you had? Oh, three. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And all your partners were, were clearly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, sometimes it's right and wrong. I mean, there's obviously right and wrong stuff, but this is just a different way of looking at things uh, and, and doing it that way. So anyway, back to it. Now we, we've, you've got people into this functional analytic uh, space of looking at noticing Use the word we use is noticing, noticing their own behaviors within the internal ex- external context, meaning their senses and their mind. Um, Say, well, how did that work? Did it did it work? And and oh, by the way, here's the real brain tease. To then don't answer that question. Just go on about your life. Ask the question, then don't answer it. Now, you folks out there might figure out why. You don't answer the question. If you answer the question, where does it send you? Where do your answer? Where would you go to get the answer? Well, we go back into the life that you want to be living. No, well, yeah. You, but to get the answer, you have to go back down in your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it won't tell you the truth. Because mm. <laughs> yeah, it's unreliable, run. sure. It's unreliable, so you're you're back to don't answer the question simply live it just go on about your life and keep living it because uh to to get your own mind to answer that question is horribly unreliable uh and uh but over time and that's what we mean by an experimental approach to behavior change uh in this case it's much like learning to walk or to ride a bicycle or to bowl or play tennis or golf or cricket or whatever uh you just don't do it the first time (laughs) got to do it over time uh and get the hang of it over time and that's what with any of this is and especially with behavior change what do you think is what why is the human condition so so challenged with uh you know stopping pausing and asking this this you know deep question of you know 
is this helpful? Well, they, most people don't ask that question. Mm. Mm, we don't do that, do we? No, no, they don't. We don't do that. I mean, we ask your question, am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, we can make the right, wrong, good, bad. <laughs> that, and they're right next door to that is good, bad. Uh, and uh, yeah, that because religion teaches us good, bad, and school teaches us right and wrong. Uh, and all of that stuff is, is ingrained into us. And so, you know, and then, um, and then we have the advertising industry. Do you have an advertising industry? No, 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 not in Australia. We're uh, non-judgmental, and we you're non-judge. Oh no! Oh well, that's don't a good measure thing. beauty and and um, <laughs> any, any of those things. We don't believe in those things. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it that that's not true. <laughs> hey, I watched the Australian Open. By the way, people, I'm a tennis player, so and I and I watched tennis sports so it has advertisements i've seen them <laughs> kia has been the uh, official sponsor for like 10 years or something yeah and you know and you're really not that. and you're really not a good person unless you have a kia and funny you know kias are not regarded <laughs> particularly highly in, in in australia so they've had to spend a lot of time to, to set themselves <laughs> with professional tennis and you know the likes of yeah. roger federer and yeah. you know, nadal and the like because Hey, if they're next to Kia, Kia must must be uh, reputable. And now I might kind of put them up against the Toyota or something that has has more of a reputation. It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, and notice how Nash just showed the relational frame look at advertising, and that's exactly it. So let's let's go back. Let's say Kia was in a frame of relationship with you know not not Star, not Star, and so we put. Kia up next to Roger Federer and Nadal and Djokovic, however you say his name, and they're stars. So, oh my God, I guess Kia's aligned with stars. You know, they're, they're valuable, and and through multiple repetitions, you your mind starts to think that way. Well, I guess Kia's not so bad. You know? <laughs> they're pretty good, uh, and that's advertising. It's basic advertising. The problem with most basic advertising, it just says you're not good enough in some way you're not rich enough you're not pretty enough you're not skinny enough <laughs> you don't have enough jewelry <laughs> you don't have enough clothes whatever you don't have enough relationships or if you do have a relationship it's not good enough uh, the list goes on and on and on and so we're really through this modern world we live in with these literally thousands of uh messages that we get per day that tell us that we're not good enough and uh, so it's so people don't really pause and look at as are my behaviors working to get me where i want to go in life it's really it's more dominated by am i getting the stuff that the social media or whatever is telling me that i need to get in order so for so i'll fit in so so in some sense i get distracted by this this uh desire to fit in and and by by that distractibility i mean you know i need the right clothes i need the right car i need the right glasses i need the right hat i need the right tennis racket you know i need the right etc uh, and so while i'm pursuing those things i don't have to go out and kind of reflect the uh, and um, too much, I can just be in pursuit of those things. And each time I get one of those, I, I, I get a bit of a, you know, an applaud, um, a little bit of joy momentarily. Exactly. Uh, wonder why my, my uh, you know, life is terrible. <laughs> All right. And then when you wake up in the morning or something, it becomes, oh, my, things aren't as great as I thought they would be. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and to get people to reflect on that and to – to look at things then to start to notice the advertising messages so people say you know how are you going to stop the advertising messages well you're not uh, no none of us are powerful enough to do that but we can certainly change our responses to the messages and notice what they're up to and so you know have people practice that's part of the ex experimentation right is when i notice uh, that there's a message saying my computer's wrong it's five years old. I need to go out and update it. Oh my God. It, so on and so That's forth. terrible. The experiment is not to buy another one. 
I'm playing with you here. Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. You know. um, this is one that I'm, you know, going through at the moment because uh, probably about a year ago, uh, my my computer's about six years old, and about a year ago. Um, you know, the, the mind was having a good, good old field day with me saying, you need to get another one. You need to get another one. And I, and I had to run the experiment of, no, no, I'll just replace the battery. Um, and I've got a, a brand new computer again. And it works. A right. Designer. Um, you know, I will go out and <clears throat> do, you know, word application type of things, a little bit of internet and these podcasts. So I, uh, I, I think it's it. good enough. Right. Uh, exactly. And so, uh, but that's it. So you notice, and then you, you, know, you have a little fun noticing uh, when you see an advertisement, what kind of emotional effect is showing up on the inside of you. Uh, oh, oh I'm, I'm feeling jealous or envious or, you know, <laughs> sad or afraid or whatever is showing up. And, they, and you can get curious about how the, the advertiser was trying to to influence you that way, which is what they were doing. Most things are sold off fear, so pretty easy. Guess the, how they're they're me, meaning I'm not good enough. Uh, the fear that I'm not good enough. And uh, is there a biological function that that um, is somewhat understood that that sort of underpins this? That you know, if yes. if I have a, a bigger tribe, if I do belong, um, I, I have a greater sense of survival greater probability oh, of, of survival is that is that what, what's underpinning this that's what the anthropologists say yeah and the the fear is you'd get shunned what do you think is it correct if you had to hazard a guess back then not too long ago in our human history to be cast out from your tribe was death you know it was a death sentence and uh, so I, I know it's not as, as dramatic, but in some sense, that's still the case, right? I mean, if that's absolutely your if, mind if, doesn't if know, I it's get not. Shunned, um, you know, when, when it comes to me getting sick, uh, uh, sure, I might be able to go to hospital, but sometimes I might need someone to drive me to hospital or take me to you hospital. You might, exactly. There, 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 there's lots of things or someone to look out for me, someone to say, hey, you know, stop being a, a, a tough, stubborn man, you know, and, and, and you know, bloody <laughs> take yourself to, to, to the doctor rather than sitting there, you know, being all, being all um, you know, masculine. Masculine, and, uh, exactly. So now you're talking about all that, that stuff. So I think... And as I said, the anthropologists go along with us is that that's a very, very powerful uh, human urge to be included and not excluded because it's dangerous to be excluded. And in, you know this from your your teenage experiences of, mm. of how horrible it felt to be excluded, how scary it was to be excluded. Uh, it, it's a powerful, powerful human emotion. Well, now if you and I had gone into advertising, you, we would be sitting here thinking, "Well, how can we exploit that?" <laughs> that Particularly thing. as a teen, I, I I had a wonderful group of friends who I'm still actually very close with, uh, but there were many occasions that in my internal world, you know, I was on the perimeter of that group. You know that I was. Uh, you know, I was different, and and I'm assuming that a lot of my peers were probably thinking the same. Oh yeah. <clears throat> now, when you get older and you have a conversation with them, you know, like, oh yeah, they were all scared to death, uh, <laughs> and everybody <laughs> thought they were one step away from being excluded and all that. Yeah, you 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 get that a lot. Uh, but that's once again your human. That's your mind playing with you, it's not looking at reality. Uh, and uh, and there usually is some other kid who is sort of outcast or kids that are outcast, and you see them, and you certainly don't want to be one of them. And uh, so it's, it's rough. But the, but so much advertising and stuff is based on just that simple biological mm-hmm. thing. The other, of course, is is love and being in relationship and. Well, we do it as adults, right? I mean, adults, because, you know, adults make money, they go to jobs. Um, now, as an adult, we still do the same thing. We just measure, you know, what career, what job. Um, and, you know, if I, if I drive a Maserati, well, then in that case, you know, I'm back, back in the tribe, you know, people. That's your ticket. Back. You're yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> You're a success. 
Uh, oh, I mean, folks don't say, but no, please don't think for a second I believe that. I'm just saying that's, that's, <laughs> that's what the culture is. Anybody who's bought a Maserati, I have not. But if you bought one, I'm sure that with the morning or two or three after you buy one, you realize, nope, that wasn't it. Uh, that didn't get me there. <laughs> Kevin, we're going we're gonna to strip this out of the podcast. It's going to be a headline. Dr. Kevin Polk says having a Maserati means you're a success. And uh, That's right. That's right. Context. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's, that's the bill of goods that were sold in, in, a, in a thousand or tens of thousands of different ways that were sold. But, and we got into this conversation of what keeps people from noticing the effects of their own behaviors, reflecting uh, on their own behaviors. And, and of course, w- what that comes down to is how you interact with other people. Because it w- well, what I have found out from doing the matrix with thousands of people, and, that, and when I say do the matrix, that means I walk into a room and I say something like, you know, I found that the best way to get started with all of this stuff is to, to ask you a, a, what I hope is a very simple question. Is it okay if I ask you a question? They go, sure. And I say, who's important to you? And we start there. I have done that question with school kids and business executives and people on sports teams and people from Africa and South America. And I've I've done it all over. Guess what? They all give me the same answers. Fancy that. (laughs) (laughs) But then somebody will say, Hey, Dr. Polk, can you do the matrix with X? (laughs) I'll go, yeah, <laughs> not a problem. Why? Because they're going to give me the same answers. Yeah. It doesn't I'm matter pretty- who they are, where they are, what yeah. they are. They're, even on a tribe in Tanzania, they're going to give me the same answers. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so, the common denominator is human. They're, they, they're human, so they go back to the same place. Oftentimes, that of the matrix, it's simply a diagram of a human being human. That's all it is. Yeah, it like brings that. you into the experience of being a human. And yeah, they, they, all say, they always say the same thing. It's, it's always wives and you know, spouses, kids, you know, sometimes business colleagues and stuff. But it's always, it's, it's always what are they, what's on the lower left? Matrix language there. That's where the yucky stuff goes. It's all the same. It's fear and anger and pain and frustration. And I'm not good enough. Uh, the kind of thoughts. It's always the same. The away moves. Well, they're almost always the same. I mean, there might be buying a Maserati, which is actually a really huge away move for a lot of people. Uh, and uh, uh, so, but, you know, that would be a special case of somebody who had enough money to spend on a Maserati uh, as, a, as an away move, but nevertheless. And uh, there might be a little bit of tour in that as well, but still. For the most part, they're just away moves. Most people shut up, they avoid, go to sleep, you know, the basic drink, drink a little bit, do some drugs, basic stuff that people do as as away moves, isolate themselves and such. And so I've just done it with all these different walks of life, and I always get the same question. So well, I don't, I really don't care who I'm doing it with. It matters none to me. I don't even, I don't even need to know their names or anything. Wouldn't you need to know if you're work, work, working with X? No, not really. This is going on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask some questions. Who's important to you? What shows up and gets in the way? It's always going to be the same answers, no matter who I work with. So that's 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 sort of the universal appeal of it. It's fun, folks. Try it out. Oh, yeah. By the way, it's free. I mean, I gave it away to the Internet, right? So it's free. You just go find it. Say the act matrix and the diagram will pop up. Look for the act matrix with the four questions. That means who and what's important to use in the lower right and the yucky stuff's in the lower left and the away moves or in the upper left and the toward moves toward who and what's important to you is in the upper right. You might be able to find one with a the circle all around it that then has, you know values or the life that you want outside of it and there you go now you, and noticing is usually in the middle 
and you got it. I didn't go play with it. I've never seen it with the with the circle all around it with, you know, uh, life being the whole way around it. I think that that's such an important... Um, it's out there. I need to make it more prominent, but it's mm. it's a more more reason meaning it's only three or four years old. So, uh, but I do it quite a bit, uh, and it represents. And the reason I do it that way is it gets people out of the idea that away moves are always bad. Away moves, yeah, you know, yeah. can be very functional. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, I, I say. You know, you you said, "Well, I have horrible pain." You know, there's unlivable pain, uh, and you. I say, "Well, what do you do?" And you said, oh, "I've discovered heroin. It works great for it. Gets me out of the pain. Cool, great. Yeah. It was workable. What do you do once the pain's gone? I go pay attention to my kids. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to say, doing heroin's bad." No, it's workable. It's working. There's there's workable things all around us that, that sometimes you know are, are that's another thing our society wants to tell us what's 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 the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, that's not. Well, we've got this crazy debate going on in Australia at the moment around you know whether we're going to allow for medicinal marijuana to uh, you know uh, show up and you know to, to be to be um, purchased and the, the crazy idea is you know if we just think about the word medicinal you know we're, we're asking we're asking about you know does this help someone you know is, is there a context in which you know marijuana can go out and help and you know it's no different to saying you know medicinal heroin which we basically already have um uh, we do. it's a form of uh of uh, opioids yeah so. exactly right. you know and 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 used very effectively when it's kind of considered in how it's how it's uh, used you know exactly right uh i'm obviously it, it took off and other things happened by the way i live in a state of maine in the united states that has medicinal marijuana and next year we'll have recreational marijuana so. oh taking the leap <clears throat> maine uh, pretty liberal place. Uh, Taking the leap, and nothing will change. <laughs> yeah, the people, the, the people who buy are the people that were using marijuana anyway, or, or whatever. You know, not the mar. You know, they they eat it. They lollipops, whatever they do, but they uh, it, it 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 doesn't increase. Life doesn't come apart or anything. Well, the ACT where I live in in, in, in Australia has also passed a some type of legislation similar to, to, to that where it says it you know it's legal, but um, it is in the state, but it's not federally. And so someone's going to be the guinea pig about you know uh, are you allowed to or, or not before? Obviously, that will get through. As it we- hasn't. <laughs> I'm to tell you on an experiential level over here in the states, feds don't care. <laughs> I, mean, they don't care. I mean, if they wanted to come after you and throw, you know, throw an extra charge at you, they might. But are they going to go chasing you around for marijuana? No, that's pretty low on their their priority list. So, uh, Kevin, it's once seems- again, as people, is, and once again, what we're talking about is workability, and we know that there are people that it works for. Like, okay, it's your choice. It's it, it can work, um, and to come from the outside and tell people what works and what doesn't work is is an actuality dangerous business and this human game that we we live because now it's basically saying my mind has determined that this is what you ought to do. And if you toe the line and do it this way, then you'll be successful. Well, all the rest of the human minds know that's not the case. <laughs> so that's, that's not it at all. And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating total anarchy and all of that, but it's... it's it's all a dangerous business that we play, telling other people how they live their lives and stuff. Kevin, you seem like you're, uh, you know, very relaxed in your nature that, uh, uh, you know, that this sort of removing judgment, you know, being able to kind of look through, look at the world through the matrix. Is this, is this kind of who you've always been or, or is, has, have you evolved and maybe this is... Oh. 
silly question, but uh, has has using the matrix kind of um, in, in some sense infused in, in in the way that you do kind of relate yes. with the world? Yes, I've always been pretty even tempered. They sort of wise kind of you know they they'd say I had a wise soul or some folks would say. Uh, however. The Matrix has given me this shorthand way of looking at all of this that, that yeah, it has leaked into my, well, yeah, I, I, I'm non-judgmental. I'm radically non-judgmental uh, <laughs> of people. <laughs> and uh, a term I came up with recently, really, but uh, it's like, I mean, unless you're just killing people or hurting other people, now I get judgmental on you. I don't like to see other people, you know, hurting other people and stuff. But other than that, you're living your life. I'm not going to judge what you're doing. I want to ask you, is it working? Does it seem to be working where you want to get in life? And now a lot of people haven't thought to ask that question. So then I say, well, there, I show you how you could look at your life and ask that question. Because it is a good thing to reflect on. Uh, and I go, oh, yeah, you know, it is a good thing to reflect on. And I think, yeah, there you go. Good for you. Go reflect and, on that. And then I'm off around, then I'm off to do my thing. So I don't, it's, it's very comfortable, uh, Nesh. It's, 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 I don't have to judge people. I don't have to tell people what to do. I, I, I just try to guide them into seeing the world from this different this perspective, this, this way of uh, noticing how things work for you. Uh, and it's, it's a good gig. It's a fun gig. So, yeah, it's made me worse. I guess you might say it's made me worse. I'm a, that's the way I, <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it, it helps. It, it just helps in a whole lot of things. Right, let's go back to tennis. So one of the big things, you know, I'm going to put out a video on it pretty soon is uh uh, how tennis players can, and any athlete, I'm just going to say tennis players, because if you watch any of the big events, you'll see one or more players go into their head and totally blow a match. Um, well, the demons have shown up. They've gotten hooked and just has taken them apart. Well, if you teach people how to just sort of notice stuff coming by and notice it <laughs> go floating on by sort of that acceptance and commitment kind of talk but i've done it with this matrix uh way then hey <laughs> it's it's just easier to stay in a zone and not get caught up in that kind of stuff uh, and notice when advertisers are poking at you and doing things to you and whether other people are poking at you and, uh and noticing what shows up inside of you. And it's, it's just sort of fun. And it's very impressive to watch, you know, the, 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 these high-level athletes uh, do that where there can be a very crucial point that they've just lost, um, you know, by, by you know, millimeters. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and literally. Between, you know, maintaining – uh, composure and going back to you know the physical world and kind of saying all right i've got to go out go back to the baseline bounce the ball three times and serve and like i did every sorry. other time versus you know go back into my um, or go potentially forward in my imagination and now i could lose the whole match or you know what it would have been like if i'd won that point or you know if that person hadn't sneezed in the you know 15 <laughs> i went up there <clears throat> Whatever nonsense kind of captures someone, you know, the, the composure is such a big part of the game. It's a huge part of the game. It, it's, it's huge. And it's that um, we're picking on tennis, but it's any part. I mean, when you lose that, when you, and in, in act terms, we'd call it hooks. You know, you get hooked by your internal experience, which is, you know, I'm not good enough and uh, I'm going to lose and then I'm going to be a horrible person. And here we go. And now they're hooked. And now, they can't serve or they can't pitch or they can't hit or they can't whatever, you know, whatever, choose your sport. <laughs> and uh, they just lose that. And, and that composure is, is such a big part of it. And, uh, and so a lot of it is if you can teach people how to keep this very even keel and notice the stuff showing up and going, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the usual stuff. My mind does that a lot, you know, 
my mind has fears and my you know, all that. Just notice it, which is, by the way, acceptance and commitment therapy stuff all over our training. We'd call it training in that part. And yeah, you just stay composed. So yeah, I stay, I'm pretty good like this. I, I'm great on the mental game of tennis. I just wish I had the physical game to back it up. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I miss the Roger Federer Novak gene or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because I have the same problem. It must be, I, just, you know, I don't get bothered too much by it. It's like <laughs> the strokes aren't there, you know. I, I must confess, neither do I except when I'm playing with my brother. <laughs> oh, then you get hooked, huh? Then there's, there's plenty of rivalry there. I heard a great one. It was pro I was working with. Uh, and I, I don't mean work with, but we were talking about this stuff. And he said, oh, man, he said, I was playing my dad once. And it was <laughs> like it was it was in a tiebreaker or something. And we're crossing over, and my dad looks at me and says, you know what? And I say, what? He said, I probably never told you you were adopted. <laughs> 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 oh, really, really. blew his mind it wasn't true but <laughs> there's enough talk, of a hook to get him off his game talk about talking trash man <laughs> well that's what we're talking about you know you can use something even that but that's such a cute story uh, of and what's he, funny is that we know that that that's designed purely as information to unsettle someone. We know that it's unreliable information, but it still has its effect. You know, the, this uh, internal experience still occurs. And this, you know, for in in um in Australia, we we um have a big big uh, sport that uh, most of the world doesn't play. Well, actually, there are some. You know, India plays it, um, which is large. I was going to say it's cricket. cricket. Um, and trash talk is a big part of cricket. You know, they, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything that's, um, you know, out of bounds. You can say anything. <laughs> I think they, they're yeah. changing it up with, um, you know, some of the microphones they put out. But I tell you what, it's, um, it's part of the sport. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, very much so. And, uh, and once again, then, then you would be teaching people how to hear that stuff and just let it. Let yeah, it you got to learn. Up. Yeah. And it, that's a learning process. That's that's mental learning. So that's how the matrix got into sports. Just that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, but it's also you know how who and what's important to you and all that kind of stuff can show up and and get you hooked and get you off your game. Everybody in sports wants to go to flow. Want to be in flow or the zone, whatever you call it. You know, zone flow. That state you get in, uh, and it's hard to stay there. Because you get hooked and pulled out of it, so that's the sort of the mental game of this. So we play that. That that's a fun thing. But a lot of what you see me doing is staying in the zone. And, and it's, it's interesting. Fun. There's there's even the 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 uh, most common hook in that space is I've been in the zone, so I should be able to maintain the zone. You know, hooks should not be part of my life. I I should be able to live hook free. Oh wow. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> do you have? Do you have? Do you have teen, a wife? Do you have teenage children? These are automatic hooks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, stuff that that, that shows, no, hooks, and you just notice the hooks and go on about being in the zone, uh, and or you know, just feeling your way back to it. It's really what it is. You experientially feel your way back to it. That's the trick. That's what the Michael Jordans, I can't think of any famous cricket players, but uh, uh, basketball over here in the States, Jordan, Michael Jordan was big on that. And, mm-hmm. But you could stay, in the, could stay in the zone, but you just got to feel your way back to it. But those folks also had a huge load of uh, skill, just basic skills to fall back on. So they're so good. They're good that even if they're not in the zone, they're still really good players. Uh, and then when they're in the zone. What made them such good players that when everyone else caught the hook of, um, all right, training's over. I've done what I need to do for the day. Um, for them, they said, no, no, training's not over. I'm going to go out and throw another, you know, thousand thousand well, shots or whatever exactly. it might be that you know that that initial hook that occurred you know 10 years prior um was not taken and they kept going 
Um, you know. Come on, let's face it. They were obsessed. Yeah, of course they were. I mean, you, how right. else can you can you perform in that level? You have to be. You just have to be. Wild. Whether it be even musicians and stuff, it's the same way. An obsession. They, they liked doing it, and then they became obsessed with doing it. So they practice thousands and thousands of hours. And, and interestingly, most musicians are, are completely obsessed. It's just that there's only a few of them that make some money from it. Oh, uh, exactly. And the rest are obsessed <laughs> and they're, they're not given the, uh, you know, the uh, luxury of making money from it. Same with, you know, incredible artists around the world, any profession in actual fact. Well, you know? Even with you know, the, the professional, any players, there's not very many of them make, make it to the level that you, where you make money at it the rest of them are just plugging along they're great they're they're very talented they just whatever just to cross over so anyway that's that's me talking about the zone and that's what you see me playing so i'm playing mm. that all the time uh and uh working to to well, why because then i work with people to help them stay in the zone so. I love the idea of also looking at life, you know, like like a bit of a game. You know, we're playing the game, not taking it too too seriously. You know, where we get too heady, um, we go out there, we experience it in 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 the um, you know in the consequential yeah. world, so to speak, knowing where yeah. our where our compass is, what what we want to move towards, and and we make those assessments as we go along. You know, am I am I getting closer or not? Is this bringing me closer or further away? Um, and I won't get too too serious about it, but um, you know, that's the, it. The, now you got it. Beautiful. Just do uh, that over and over again. Yeah. All rinse this. repeat. What what Nesh just said? Do that over and over again. And you'll, <laughs> you you got it. That's it. That's what you're about. Your head will show up and say, "Well, no." What your head will show up and say is, "It's too simple." Of course, can't be can't be this this easy. This can't simple. be this can't be this simple. It is, but your mind won't believe it. That's all right. My mind doesn't believe it either, but that's all right. I do it anyway. Kevin, uh, how can people <laughs> how can people find out more about the work that you do, the training that you do, get in contact? The basic training. Uh, we end up doing. You know, we we have we did set up a thing where we'll certify people in the ACT Matrix. Not that you need to be certified to do it, but it was handy for some people. Uh, and we have, you know, and or you can not get it. You can get advanced training, so you can try and get to this. I don't know, this crazy level I get to of playing it. Uh, but that's on theactmatrixacademy.com. And so Google the Act Matrix Academy, and boom, there I'll be. And uh, But the basic training is always free. So you put in your email address, and voila, you'll, it'll be Phil. Phil's my partner in all of this. Uh, he's been using, he was like the second person to use the Matrix. So he's he's been with it since its inception and uh we we throw throw you through a video series and teach you the basics of how to do it and then it's just like anything else like what we were just talking about if you go practice it a lot you'll get very good at it and that it's, it's not that you have to have any great insights however is it coming sort of fun for some people to come talk to people like me yeah it's fun you know <laughs> do that stuff and and then you can sign up for training that's 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 where i am is the act matrix academy.com uh there's dr kevin polk.com but that really just takes you back over to the act matrix academy because i devoted my life to teaching this to every corner of the universe that i can get a hold of so that's what i do if i'm not playing tennis or something <laughs> And it's been I'm playing with bees. I'm a beekeeper too. I, I forgot to get into bees. So. Got to be very mindful and notice what works with bees, honeybees. So I haven't I haven't played with bees, and I think I'll. Um, I'm happy to uh, keep doing that away move. Um, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that that's not towards the way I want to see my life. <laughs> I don't like playing with the bees. I like tennis. I like you know so, and I like doing this. So it's been really. A, a lot of fun coming on and talking about it. Thank you very much for your time. I I, I could spend you know uh, the next three days having a chat and a <laughs> laugh and, and 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 chewing the fat, so to speak. Um, I, I think the world's richer for your 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 contribution. Um, I, I think it's it's a beautiful, beautifully simple. Um, uh, model that so has so many applications you know if, if you're human 
you can get something from this. You can get something from it. So if you're a human with language, you're, you're all set. You're all set. <laughs> So thank you very, very much. I hope to, I hope to be able to get you back on the podcast at some oh, point. Um, I'd so love to. I'll, I'll reach out again. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Polk. Cheers. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe. Share it via social media. And tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this podcast able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you